good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Tech Talk. Um, thank you all for taking the time. Um, <clears throat> I would like to introduce the speaker today. Um, Balaji Prabhakar is a professor at Stanford University. Um, he teaches computer networking and a lot of related stuff. He, he has done uh, a lot of groundbreaking work in the area and Lately, he has digressed into the field of uh, traffic jams and how incentives can be used to uh, um, to prevent some of those traffic jams. And he has done uh, an actual experiment, so um, which has been fairly successful. Um, and he's going to review the results of that experiment. It was done in Bangalore, India, which is pretty much the worst e traffic ex example out there today. Um, so without taking much of your time, I'll hand over the mic to Balaji. Thank you, thank you Abhishek. Uh, thank you all for coming. The good thing is that you can think about this as you're going home today. There's going to be some extra time on the road for you. Um, quick, uh, so we all know about traffic jams and how bad it can be. But uh, do you know uh, how traffic looks in Bangalore? Do you have a sense for it? Uh, do, have people traveled to Bangalore? Have you heard horror stories? OK. Uh, it's probably like um, Abhishek said, you know, the, one of the top two worst traffic. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, spots on the planet. This is not. This is a very fast-moving and speeded-up video of Hyderabad. And Bangalore is way worse. There isn't a, an appropriate video to show you just how bad traffic is and why it is that way. It's just people just driving as they please. And things work. I mean, there are, you know, 20 kilometers per hour you can afford to do things like this. But anything more and you're in trouble. So this is sort of what uh, you know uh, happens, and there, the newspapers in India are all about how bad traffic looks. Um, and so let me start off into my talk on incentive mechanisms. Okay. So this is joint work with uh, Naini Gomes and Deepak Marugu, who are here, and Rama from Infosys Technologies in Bangalore and uh, many people from Infosys, and Gajanana Krishna, who's a student at Stanford. What did we do? Well, we came up with some incentive mechanisms and tried them out. Uh, but what's the, there's a broader theme to the work I've sort of uh, observed in the last year. I want to sketch it out for you. Why is it that for computer science and electric, electrical engineering or economics type people uh, that a topic like this is interesting? So let's consider this uh, societal networks, right? Societal networks are uh, networks like this that we use uh, in society, like transportation networks, uh, electricity networks, and recycling systems. You can throw in sewage systems and utility systems and all of these as well. And for an operational definition of these networks, let's go, uh, you know, let's give it a sort of a uh, an engineering style definition, something we can do something with. So here's my attempt at it. So societal networks are uh, networks that enable society to consume the resources that it needs through a combination of technological uh, mechanisms and, hum uh, and they rely on their efficiency, uh, on, on the correctness of human actions. So whether we choose to turn off the lights, whether we choose to recycle or not, has a big impact on how efficient the systems are. So for us, say computer scientists, the interesting uh, areas to engage are this technology can be a lot better. Uh, you know, not very surprisingly, a lot of these networks retain an architecture and a method of deployment that's at least 50 years old. Okay, and they haven't. You know, we talk about ossification of the internet uh, in, in 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 computer networks research. How it's difficult to do anything for the internet without you know, being worried about retrofitting your solution. 
it's way worse than these kind of networks. So there are people who don't touch these things, right? For fear of not, you know, getting it to work again. So it's really important for us to consider this, this better technology. And, you know, if uh, we can build all we want, if it's not, the correct use is not made of it, then it can be very inefficient. So just to give you uh, an example, I was giving a talk like this in Bangalore, and the energy secretary for the state of Karnataka, where Bangalore, uh, to which Bangalore belongs, uh, mentioned this problem of um, irrigation. Uh, so the electrical networks feed this arable land where these farmers get water supplied to them or the electricity that pumps, that, that generates, uh, that, that runs the electric pumps, uh, that, that feeder line is, uh, you know, uh, the, the electricity board turns it on at 4 in the morning. And so then you can irrigate your lands at 4 in the morning. The water doesn't evaporate immediately, so, you know, it's better use of uh, the water. But, of course, 4 in the morning is very early. Farmers are all still in bed. But, of course, the previous night, every farmer has left the pump in the on position, right, and then gone to bed. Now, you see what happens, right? A circuit breaker strip, keep doing this a few times, and it's a big headache. It's a problem where everything ha everybody has the right intention, and yet it just seems like a massive, you know, focused loading problem that we've just manufactured, right? And so he was asking, what incentive mechanisms will you deploy here? I was saying, well, this is trivial. I mean, technologically, it's trivial because you just have a randomize the timer at every pump. It's, it's a completely easy problem for any, you know, person to do. So this is the sort of thing you could do, and it's a big deal. Uh, you can just simply, you know, engaging in this type of work, there are many examples, many situations where problems that seem uh, out of one's um, control actually become very amenable to a treatment. So let me just start off with this pop quiz. This is intended for everybody, in particular for students. So you'll see this, uh, you know, we've all seen places like that. Uh, Texas Transportation Institute has a study, and they put out this number. What do you think is the number uh, that captures the total wasted dollars in time and fuel in 2005? Uh, it's, it's cost in the sense that all the fuel that's burnt waiting in traffic is definitely a waste. It could have been avoided if congestion wasn't there. Right, so D, yep. So obviously it's like a big number, but if you calibrate it against other big numbers we've seen recently, it's like you give 25 billion to the auto guys so they can bail them out and then they build cars and, you know, blow 80 billion, right? This is, this is 2005 gas prices, by the way, right? So, um, it's 3 billion gas, uh, gallons wasted in congestion, according to the study. It's a study of 437, uh, you know, uh, urban slash semi-urban sort of centers in the U.S. But what does 3 billion gallons mean? It's all the fuel that's consumed in the U.S. Uh, over six days. Okay. This is a pretty serious uh, amount of wastage that, you know, incur we're incurring. Now, similarly, let's look at recycling systems. In California, you get five cents for returning soda cans or bottles of water, or you know, plastic or bottle, if they're less than 22 ounces, and then it's 10 cents if it's bigger. Uh, how many states in the U.S. do you think have uh, the so-called bottle bill or container deposition law, uh, where you do get a refund? You want to just guess? Five. Well, it turns out to be 11. <laughs> slightly better, but very far from 50, right? That's the point, right? And seven states are still campaigning, and if you want to know what the states are, the green ones have it, the blue ones are in the wait list. But why, why, is, why, why is there a wait list, and why isn't it just spontaneous that everybody can do it? Well, part of the problem is, of course, not how many of you go and collect the five cents? Zero, right? So it's cost to you. So the beverage manufacturers understand this, like, you know, if I sell a can of whatever soda for 50 cents and you pay me 5 cents extra for this law that is 10% of the cost and you don't, you don't go and claim it, well, then I'm going to be not interested in getting the charge put on it, right? So, it's, so there's, there's things to worry about, uh, you know, what's the right way to do it? Can we make recycling simple and easy and effective, right? 
I'm sure, you know, and I have, we have some ideas, and we're happy to discuss this with you uh, offline. But let me get to the, uh, oh, here's an interesting thing. How many cans do you think we consumed in 2008? Just cans. There's no bottles or, or plastic or anything. C. Well, this is a trick question such as sneaky professors are in the habit of asking. Why is it bigger than, 10 times bigger than you thought, right? So it's a staggering number. If everything had five cents on it, that's $4 billion stuck in un, you know, recycling, recyclables, right? So, and it costs 20 times the energy to make aluminum can from ore than to just reuse or recycle aluminum can. Somebody needs to. Uh, whoever just dialed in, can you please mute? Okay. So I thought, like, there's a recycling facility that I went to recently, and then, you know, or there's all these aluminum cans that get magnetized and they fly off the conveyor belt. It's a very interesting process. It's been around for many years. Perhaps we can even you know, improve the efficiency of these kind of things. So that's uh, all I'm going to do by way of general background. So let me get into transportation and congestion pricing, which is the theme of my talk, right? And... Uh, this is a one-slide summary of what our whole approach is about. So for those of us who are familiar with computer networks, some of these themes are, uh, have, we've already been through this in the telephone and computer networks or dichotomy in the, lay, in the late 80s and early 90s. So uh, congestion pricing, uh, you know, there's, there's good economic uh, arguments in favor of it. The most uh, common goes back to William Wickery uh, in 69. And it's the so-called tragedy of commons. If you give away a good, like, road use for free, then it's, it's going to suffer from overuse, okay? And therefore, you need to price it. And congestion prices have been levied in these places like London, Stockholm, Singapore. Uh, and they're effective in, in addressing congestion, I mean, to, to various degrees. And, but they're, they're, they're also not uh, unpopular. They're unpopular for... They're not popular... Uh, for various reasons, like, you know, citizens complain that why don't you just call it yet another tax, and that's all it is. And it's undemocratic in the sense that it favors the rich, and it's expensive to deploy. You know, it takes a lot to figure out whether people have paid or not, right? There's no turnstile which opens if you enter London. You're just driving around, and you could be someone who hasn't paid. How do I know that? Well, I scan your license plate numbers, and then I check against my record. So it's a pretty intense video surveillance uh, program in London and in Stockholm, okay? And Singapore uses an RFID tag system. So it's a pretty expensive system. Uh, this is reminiscent to us of the telephone network type, you know, system where all the intelligence is inside the network, the end systems are dumb. One could consider flipping that, like we did in the Internet, um, put the intelligence in the vehicles. That's one thing we could do. And, for example, cell phone, GPS-type things exist now. Uh, but on, on the economic side, we're saying, let, let's make it a market. Let's charge the congestors and pay the decongestors, right? And the system gets to keep some money to run itself, but, you know, the, the main goal of congestion pricing is actually to get rid of congestion and, and to encourage people who help to decongest, okay? And so that's uh, one major sort of theme, and then this how to deploy it. And perhaps if we, you know, we've seen that we could do, if deploy it incrementally. It's not necessary for everybody. If you, if you declare a behavior incentive uh, for your congestion uh, pricing scheme, then you're just saying, I'm going to induce a behavior in the, in the commuter that leads to decongestion. I'm not going to promise to reduce congestion itself. This is a little, again, like the Internet, you know, best effort service. What's the, that promise is nothing, right? So it can actually take off. The co contrast to the other systems, other, other types of networks that people are considering, like ATM, for example, it was promising too much, right? So congestion is not an easy thing to get rid of. You can promise all you want. It's not very easy to deliver on it. So we're saying let's, let's, let's lessen the goals, okay? So there are three things. Make it a market. Put the intelligence in the vehicles. Consider lessening the goal from getting rid of congestion to, you know, increasing decongesting behavior, Okay. So let's see how this all worked out in a particular deployment. It, and you'll see that it's very context-dependent, right? So that's why experimental economics is different from experimental physics, because they run the same experiment on different days, different places, you get different answers. 
and there's nothing wrong with it as a science. That's what you suppose. That's how, that's how it is, right? So, please, you know, feel free to ask me questions or otherwise, you know, uh, orient the discussion. So there are two main ideas that we have. One of which I've already uh, mentioned to you, which is this right to congest can be made into a tradable commodity. And this is incentive compatible in the sense that the, the, the congestor and the decongestor are both encouraged to participate. Congestor en encounters le reduced congestion, and the decongestor is, you know, paid uh, for yielding the road to the congestor. Okay. And again, sort of, you know, going on with this networking analogy, if you look at the the delay versus load curve in any network system, we always see this sort of you know, when the, when the load is small, the delay is small, but as load approaches capacity, which is normalized to be one here, you see the delay goes to infinity, right? This is canonical. And so if you go to a congested network and reduce the load by about 5%, then the corresponding reduction in delay is a lot more than 5%, right? Because it sort of just quickly saturates. Now, the question is, which 5% are going to drop out? Well, let the market decide it. Okay, so that's all, we, all we're aiming for is some 5% to just volunteer, right? That's what we want. So let's see how that, you know, can be caused. A second uh, thesis that we use, uh, what's, you know, there, there used to be a lemma here, and I think I've taken it out just, you know, I, I just noticed it. But it's a, there's a statement uh, in, this, in, in the theory of expected utility maximization, which says that in a game with low stakes, players are more risk-seeking. So the point is, if the market decides that the congestion price is actually not eight pounds like it's in London, but perhaps 25 pence or 50 pence, uh, who's going to yield the road for 50 pence? How, who's expected? I mean, how do you expect anybody to travel, you know, half an hour earlier or half an hour later just on the promise of 50 pence? That's just too small a sum of money, right? So don't give them 50 pence, put it into a lottery, and then draw, and then pay them you know, either 100 pounds or 1,000 pounds or whatever, right? A well-advertised lottery scheme. And that's the auxiliary thesis, right? So um, is everybody okay with this, what I just said, that, that, uh, that this is something else we use? Because sums of money can just dramatically come down. Then what do you do, right? So how do you keep the decongestor interested? Well, first of all, they should benefit from, from the decongesting behavior. It's not like a decongestor is going to be happy with some small odds lottery if they basically, you know, don't get to commute at all, right? So, so that's the sort of thing we tried, and I'll we'll tell you how it went. Um, there's a lot of related literature, like I said, I'm going to skip over this. This is from a conference that we just had last week, Network Economics conference last week, or two weeks ago. And this is just, you know, FYI, in case you want to look at it. No, the notable paper is by Vickery here, uh, is the so-called tragedy of commons phenomenon, where free goods tend to get over over this is the grazing that he was talking about the, the gra grounds the commons where cattle can graze uh, for free belongs to the entire village but then it usually suffer from overgrazing okay so that was the starting point and then it so it went um, let me just get into this project the instant project um, here is the for those of you who haven't been to Bangalore or don't know how it looks geographically this is how it looks now uh, it's also changed its name to Bengaluru. And what it, uh, what's happened is that there's something that used to be called Core Bangalore, which is very small in, in an area, 226 square kilometers. Now, there's a greater Bangalore because the city has just grown dramatically, almost doubled in, in its population over the last 15 years. And so the greater Bangalore area is that bigger circle. Most people live here, but they work in this place called B down there. B is Electronic City. I hope you can read it, but I'll point it out to you. This is Electronic City, which is an economic development zone, so it's cheaper to have your big companies there. So Infosys is there. Others like Wipro, Siemens, HP, they're all over there. And this 15-kilometer road, uh, infamous 15-kilometer <laughs> road, it's a national highway. You can see the national highway number seven. It's called Hosu Road. And everybody, you know, lives inside that red ellipse and commutes down. So it's a little bit of a funnel, right? It's like, you know, there's a congestion. And it's all about crossing, you know, leaving 
there's a, there's a road here which I will show you on a different map. You have to cross this point just essentially here before 7.30 a.m. If that's the case, you had a great day. It's a fantastic commute day for you. If you're stuck on the other side, inside the red ellipse at 7.30, then your commute now just went a factor of two, two and a half times longer. Okay? So that's the problem. It's a very, well, it's not, it's not very different from the Bay Bridge problem. This crowd that comes from Sacramento and East Bay just into Bay Bridge, similar. This, it's like a phase transition, right? That's a well-known problem. And you can replace the names of these, you know, things and sort of morph it into a problem here. It's also similar to the problem from New Jersey to New York, for example. Uh, you know, commuters face this. So, um, so you know, you can sort of view this as a, as a problem of a general type, yes. Do they have HOV lanes? No, they don't. Uh, they they barely have lanes, right? <laughs> Meaning, it's not even clear there's a lane sometimes, right? So certainly nobody drives like there's a lane, right? So, so the, here's a one slide synopsis of the Instant Project. Well, in, Instant stands for Infosys Stanford Traffic Project, okay? And what uh, the synopsis is, that was launched on October 6th as a pilot. We ran it for six months uh, until April 10th, and the, the, the results are summarized as there are a total of 20,000 people working at Infosys in Bangalore, of which 14,000 were eligible for the scheme, because the others were uh, either uh, based, their, their base was not Bangalore, so they didn't belong to the Bangalore payroll system, and they were on loan to the Bangalore office, or they were contractors. Right, so these people weren't eligible. Everybody else was eligible. Whether you took the company buses or you drove yourself in or public transport, whatever, you were eligible. So of the 14,000 employees, uh, we will see that essentially the number of people traveling at this uncongested time of earlier uh, than 7.30 crossing the point, we'll show you very precisely what the times were, uh, doubled okay, uh, com compared to the historical data. And the uh, total of, you know, when you have 14,000 employees, certainly you can't pay them all. If all of them choose to come early, there isn't enough money to go around to make it interesting. So we paid this, this lottery-style thing, and the, the average winner, uh, the average money taken by the winner was $28. If we had essentially doled this out as a constant amount of money to split the jackpot, that is, then it wouldn't have amounted to more than 10 rupees, Okay which is an interesting, nobody's going to wake up like half an hour early or to just get like 10 rupees. That's, that's not even a cup of coffee, okay? So we'll see exactly what sums of money were involved. Okay, so um, quickly then, the Infosys uh, uh, bus fleet consists of around 240 buses. It fluctuates 220, 240, seasonal and, 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 and uh, you know, size of commuter population dependent. And they have, actually, that's January 2005. Uh, the, the commuting data is available in this very nice, detailed uh, form for many years. We looked at 2005, January to 2008, June. But if you look at this um, spreadsheet, bus number 54 on a certain day, and this is available for every day, picked up at 7 a.m. from this place called Jainagar, 4th Block, 18th Main. That, that's the intersection. It came into Infosys at 7.32 a.m., so it's 32-minute commute time. The bus has 49 seats, but there were 61 people, so 12 people were standing. Okay? Other buses had spare capacity, so empty seats. Okay? So you get journey time and occupancy numbers. Okay? So now if you look at the commuters, what buses they chose to take, uh, over the data, the duration of the data we looked at, the total number of commuters went up. That's the green line. But more and more people were preferring to come in in the later buses. Right? The, 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 the raw number of early commuters was going down. So you had this sort of preference for traveling at the later time, which is the heavily congested time. Now, what happened, of course, was that you know these buses got crowded in the later times, and, and commuters were demanding that more buses be deployed. This is true for any public transport system as well. I mean, everybody goes in the peak time, and the peak time, you know, there just isn't enough room. And the big complaint from the commuters is have more vehicles. 
And so all public transport systems are capacitated for just peak, right? So if you go to the peak and drop it by 5%, that's just 5% savings in the fleet for the public transport entity, okay? So they can't run them fast enough, okay? So that's happening here, happened here. And if you look inside the buses, this is showing you uh, how many buses on the y-axis had how many people, okay? So the blue bars correspond to the early buses. So this number here means, for example, uh, this means like roughly five or six buses in the month of June had between 41 and 45 people when the total capacity is 49, okay? Now, this is, these red bars are showing you that these buses are over capacity. And in fact, there are 50, close to 50 buses that had more than, you know, seven or eight people beyond capacity. That's the average, monthly average. And so, you know, these buses had all these, you know, people standing, and unfortunately for them, they were standing for an extra long period of time. This shows you the commute times, again, monthly averages, from this place, Jainagar, which is popular. That is, a lot of commuters come from here. And if you left at a 6.15 a.m. time, so this is not exactly one slot of time, but, you know, there's a range, but let's call it 6.15. That was the earliest time. So you, you basically had a 30-minute commute time, okay? That is, that's the propagation delay, okay? But if you left at 7.45, it's still okay. You got a 40-odd minute commute time. But then later, it shot up to 75. That's the average. And the variance numbers are pretty huge at these times and not so bad here. I mean, there's a paper that has the variance numbers in case you want to look at it. So you ha sat in crowded buses and you had a longer commute time. And this is also true for other popular starting points like this Adarsh Garden and this Minerva Circle, same thing. So we showed this to the commuters at the end of the June 2008. So Deepak, who, was, who had access to this data, just collected all these results and showed it and said, now that you see that it's, you will have a more comfortable ride and a shorter ride, you will all get up early tomorrow and then just, you know, we thought this was hap going to happen, right? Obviously it didn't. Uh, and the reasons were interesting. The reasons were, um, uh, at least well, some of the complaints we heard were, uh, it's a team-oriented type of work, therefore there's no point in me coming at 8.30 in the morning with the rest of my team's coming at 10, right? That's one of the things. The other thing was uh, I may need to stay longer in the evening to make a phone call uh, overseas, therefore I'll be coming in later tomorrow, the next day. And then this persists. You come in late, you go late, you come, you know. So these are the kind of things we heard. But it is a young workforce, you know. The average age is pretty small. They have a lot of income, so, you know, late nights and sleeping in. It's like grad students with lots of money, right? So <laughs> why wouldn't, you know, you'll enjoy uh, life as it were. So we said, okay. And then, and then they were sort of also skeptical. So you, you, I come in early, like 8.30 or 8, 9 a.m., but no matter when I go home, I'm, I'm going to be stuck in bad traffic, right? Bangalore, after 7.30 a.m., the traffic only drops at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. So what's the point of, so, so, was, so the perception was, right? This is, people have a very intuitive feeling of congestion. They, they come in with like personal, <laughs> strong personal opinions. So we said, why don't we just take some GPS device and see actually what the actual times look like, right? So we ran this. I'm gonna not show you the video data. This is already something you've seen, right? Like we, Deepak and I were sitting in this bus and we showed what the road looks like at 6.30 a.m. or 7 a.m. People hadn't seen this, right? A lot of them just hadn't seen what 7M looks like. So we showed them, right? This one was something, I'm just gonna show you the GPS. And what we're gonna do is just race these two buses. There's a 6.15 AM bus and an 8.15 AM bus, and they're both starting at the same place and coming to the same place. And we're gonna race them like this. So the blue dot and the yellow dot are going to the same place just at different times. So as you can see, uh, one guy has just already reached, but that has about, this, this, this category of commuter is about 15% of the population, right? The remaining 85% are stuck over there, quite far away from the destination. This actually had a chilling effect, <laughs> right? People are like, everybody's looking at themselves sitting in that bus. So, you know, it's 29 minute commuting time versus 82, and then when this evening numbers 
were also fairly um, revealing. So if you left at 5 p.m., you're on your way home, uh, and the guy is just over there. Um, we heard a lot of things from commuters, like, you know, this, they ran some, their own optimization algorithms exist, where this, 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 this place, this road, this bend in the road, is infamous. It's called Silk Board or BTM Layout, and where it's, you know, it has, and it's a massive bottleneck. And we were sitting in this bus, and around this bend are like seven or eight Infosys buses, where you can see around the bend, like over there is another bus, and then ahead of him is another bus, and so on. So this commuter basically told us, like, you know, if you get off this bus, walk over to that bus over there, that's 30 seconds of walking time here, but you'll save about 10 minutes in the whole journey time, right? So if I'm late for a meeting, I'll jump out of this bus and run over to that bus. And I thought, okay, great. <laughs> you know, this is an optimization that they've all come up with, right? So, so as you can see, you know, again, you know, you save about 45 or minutes in the evening and similar time in the morning. So we just ran this, and then it was, it was a little bit more. It was long, large town hall meetings, right? So it's very interactive. People, you know, were telling us what they thought. So we ran this, and there was a little bit more conviction. First of all, in, in, in us, but also they were a little bit more convinced. So the summary of this whole data is it's long time no seat. And uh, we ran this experiment. What I'm handing out is pamphlets. So if you can just look at it and return them, you know. We advertise the scheme. The buses you're going to see there, so this is the very bus on which they commute, okay? So this is a photo of the vehicle that they commute in. And um, we ran this scheme explaining all these benefits in a website that, you know, you can have shorter commute times, you have more comfortable rides, you save a lot of fuel costs, fuel cost savings exist. And so perhaps one way to subsidize and monetize this whole incentive mechanism is to take that fuel cost and apply it and give it back to the commuters, that, that is, those that come at the uncongested times. So this is a you know, lottery, and this is sort of the incentive mechanism we ran. And so the way it works is, uh, let's look at the commuter's arrival time. And if that arrival time happened to be before 8 a.m., then they earned uh, one and a half credits on that day. And if they arrived between 8 and 8.30 a.m., then they earned uh, one credit. And you therefore had a credit history. It's like a frequent flyer program, okay? It's like, you know, you just earned a credit history. And your credit history, every week, this was used to choose winners. An incentive mechanism got your credit history and then it, it had the money uh, you know, given to it. And so the pyramid of rewards looks like this. We had 96,000 rupees, which is around 2000 or $2,300, depending on exchange rates, uh, available to us. So the pyramid looks like this in the sense that the bottom level uh, requires at least three credits for you to qualify to the bottom level. And you could earn 500 rupees as a reward if you won over here. And there were 48 such prizes available. And at the topmost level is 12,000 rupees. And there were two such prizes. And you needed at least 20 points to get into that top level. Okay? So this is how we had the pyramid of rewards. Yes? Right. I think it, they will. Uh, but one of the reasons we wanted something for everybody was to climb to the top of 14,000, uh, it's a long way. So we didn't want people to not even start. Right. So, you know, many people started, as you'll see during the, the history, the histogram of this thing is after three months, people began to sort of join uh, and change their behavior. So we wanted something for them. That's, that's the bottom level. But we're relaunching this. Well, Infosys has uh, announced, uh, well, at least let us know, that they want to now do this sort of permanently, but in all of their eight development centers in India. So one of the things that's come up is people who have been consistently coming early and doing the right thing, losing out just by the luck of the draw to other people, and it's very irritating. <laughs> it's like, you know, how come this other person that I know started three months ago suddenly is winning and I, or has won or, and I haven't won at all, right? So we would like to make a little bit of what you're saying, give some deterministic 
tries us non non random amounts out to the absolute top but then the rest are encouraged to participate now this the, the way we did it was uh, you know imagine that this is how the people stacked up at the different levels for example there were three people this week uh, at the top level qualified for the top level and, and two for the second level and so on the way the scheme worked was the goals were that the more uh, you the more points you had the higher the prizes you could win which is clearly true by the nature of the pyramid but also the better the odds that you won something at all okay so we will draw from the top two of those three were picked out and given this 12000 rupee prizes i mean just to calibrate 12000 rupees are around a third or a half of a month's salary uh for the uh, uh, the 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 grades of employment and the bottom grade where a lot of the employees uh, where there were a lot of employees uh, this this translates 12,000 translates to about a third or half of their monthly salary roughly speaking okay so it wasn't it wasn't insubstantial so they were happy to win that and and the person who did not win at the top level and, and you know societal networks you never say loser there is there is you say non winner right it's like the right this is something right in computer networks we do all sorts of things to packets i mean we 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 drop them we we scramble them their their feelings don't get hurt right <laughs> he had to be a little bit more sensitive right so i learned <laughs> okay. not that i said anything but just inst- you know you sort of understand that this is so the people who didn't win at the top were automatically qualified for the next level so we drew them for the second level of prizes and you know in this case it so happens that a few people and prizes so which never happened but you know it can uh so you give them the prizes and push, push the money down and then keep going uh and then these people are automatically qualified for the next level keep going and so at the end of the week draw you had a list of winners and you had a list of uh, non winners and you subtracted points from the winners by some amount and from the losers by some other smaller amount and just re- you know went again that's it right it's a little like redeeming your frequent flyer miles that's it so your account got docked a bunch of points that's basically it okay so are you okay with this okay so as you can see that that's it you've achieved all our goals with the scheme of like you know trying to reward the more consistent be you know uh, early commuter but of course this is a randomness element which we're going to address So the results are historical data is here and the end of the experiment is here okay so the experiment was launched uh, around here okay 6th of october and compared to the historical data we more or less doubled the number of early comers uh, in every category meaning 8am before 8am before 8:30 and before 9 So for example let's look before 9 um around 4200 or 4500 people are coming before 9 uh in the historical data and that's now up to 9000 or so um and so this is sort of a trend that you know sustained but there was a fantastic social uh, aspect to this it's like you know because in a company you know who who the, typically you know you know your buddies won and that made people aspire to win and all the other reasons like you know what's the point of me coming early if the rest of my team's coming late with this scheme it was more like well i hope i come early and everybody else comes late right so then you know so it's sort of because the game theoretic aspect kicks in right so it's so a lot of these things just went away and then people could break their cycle of having stayed back late one or two days either for phone calls or for you know project related you know work and and then shifting their pattern from a morning person to an evening person they could break back into the so there were there were various sort of uh uh consequences okay now if you look at uh the average commute time on the y axis versus the months during which we ran the scheme it came down from about 70 and a half minutes to around 54 minutes averaged across the entire bus commuter population and so the person are saved you know there are the numbers and it's not that the company's got it nor that the commuter's got it but it's it's commuter has it in you know for their life right that is 
they could they could devote this time into their own personal you know for their own personal benefit so this is one thing we saw and then of course the interesting question is what happens after the scheme discontinued okay so it, there's a sticky aspect to having the price be made available so it sort of bounced back right a little bit as of may we haven't updated the numbers but the good good news is that, in a sense, is that the same commuters who complained uh, about crowded buses in the later times and a redeployment of the fleet towards the later time now began to insist or demand that buses come earlier. Right. So we had a number of letters mailed to us or emails sent to us and, and the transportation department where they were complaining about how some drivers are just too slow or they're too chatty. They talk to their colleagues in the bus depot wasting time while they could be like getting these guys early so they can swipe in, right? And we got complaints from the drivers saying, you know, these people used to come and just like sleep in the bus or text or whatever, you know, listen to their music. Now, like the guys, like they're outside my cabin, like banging on the thing and saying, look, it's 7.45, can you step on it? Because we need to go and swipe in and things like this. And we also got emails saying, my building is further away from the depot. So it can't be 8 a.m. is my swipe in time. It should be 8 or 5 a.m., right? Because I need the extra walking time. Otherwise, it's not fair. Things like this, right? So people began to really care about the minutes of their day. And so I have a letter here, which is, you know, if I have time at the end, I'll read it out to you. It's like, <laughs> it was a fun, fun email for us to receive because it's like, the, the guy's taken like three-fourths of a page just to complain about this one driver, okay, who he doesn't like. And then he prefers his other driver. Uh, I'll read it out. I mean, it's all about just get me into work so I can swipe in, right? So, and then when card readers weren't working, we got all sorts of complaints. So it's an interesting project, very different from the other kind of things that we've been doing. So here are the adjustments to the bus schedule as of February. Uh, this is how many buses got advanced by how much time. So there were some buses that were moved by five minutes. This is a 7.57 arrival, became a 7.52 arrival, giving people more time, that sort of thing. And some by 10 minutes, some by 15. And the last category is these buses used to arrive after 8.30 a.m., but they all moved to arrive before 8.30 a.m., so more people could participate in this instant scheme. Okay. So this is somehow a permanent fix, right? So this is there. I mean, because this takes about a month they're negotiated with a bus company. They have to reschedule their fleet. I mean, it's like, it's, 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 it's some, it takes some doing. Okay? So, um, I'll conclude the talk, uh, the presentation. What are the next steps? Well, uh, well, first of all, you know, this is a, one of the nice fun experiments uh, that, you know, that shows that it's, it is worth considering a market approach to congestion pricing. And, it's uh, more widely applicable in the sense that there are these other entities that we've spoken to. Um, what's Stanford's problem? I don't know if you know this. Stanford has a huge uh, problem with uh, it, the number of people that arrive into Stanford and depart from Stanford. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be a very precisely, you know, there's a cap on it. The County of Santa Clara beats us up by refusing to issue uh, permits for buildings and other things because we're not allowed to bring in people or take them out uh, in excess of some number. And that there's a, the worst one hour in the morning and the worst one hour in the evening cannot have more than, I think it's 5,300-odd people entering or exiting. Okay, So we have all these campaigns. This is the back of a Stanford bus. That's a parking lot. So we have the provost office spends a fair amount of money on this. And it's pretty open loop at the moment. It's like, you know, build it or give people free bus passes or give them money if they give up obtaining a parking permit. It's called clean air cash. So it's not usage-based. There's no monitor, you know, monitoring of how people are doing various things. So one thing we're considering is moving to a RFID sort of parking tags and then figuring out how the when people are coming and then giving back some money from their parking fees. Because you all know parking fees are like a big thing in the university, right? Parking for faculty. Yeah. It's, it's, this, is, this is all the great American university needs to have beer for students, uh, sports for alumni, and parking for faculty, right? This is the great sort of 
<laughs> this, is what, this is what every president sort of, you know, has in their mind when they assume the office at a university, right? So this parking is a big revenue generating thing, but we're happy to give back some money, let's say, you know, 10%, 20%, depending on how infrequently you travel during peak times, okay? And there's other entities like Cambridge UK uh, has, the county of Cambridge has been uh, uh, told by the UK government that if they get themselves a, what they call a demand management scheme, which is just a euphemism for pricing uh, scheme, uh, they will get 500 million pounds, right, to deploy it. And there's a lot of interesting reasons why Cambridge is facing this problem. Most notably, the Londoners have moved into Cambridge and sort of taken up a lot of property there and then driven the prices up. So the regulars, the people who live and teach at the university and, and, and live in the city of Cambridge, have been pushed out, so they commute. This has driven uh, congestion levels higher, and they find the sort of an incentive approach uh, possibly more humane, right? <laughs> or, or it's an easier, it's a more politically expedient at, at any rate. Uh, it's people, politicians find it easier to say, we're going we're gonna to be like the Robin Hoods, right? We're going to charge the congestors and give the decongestors money back. So that's, that's the, and this is now not in fall 2009, but spring 2010. I'm going to teach a course on, uh, uh, Never taught a course outside of networking, so we, or algorithms, right? So it'd be interesting to see how this goes. Uh, should be fun. Um, finally, you know, there's a discussion we want to have with Google. This is an interesting. The last project here listed here is an interesting. Oh, there's a Bangalore bus service folks that are potentially going to use this scheme starting October to re, uh, load balance their bus fleet. You know, this, uh, for those of you who've seen like the caricature, the typical image of the Indian train or bus is like people on the roof, people like coming out of the windows, bus sort of, you know, swaying under the weight of the people. That's not, you know, once like in, in six months or something. It happens every day. And this load, which is around 160% during peak time, uh, needs to be shifted somewhat to the off-peak time. And why would they shift? I mean, it's just, first of all, it's safer, it's blah, blah. But why would people shift? Well, just because we're going to give them incentive, right? So... There's this fleet called the Big Ten Bus Service, which was launched in February, and they might do this. And it also allows the public transportation uh, folks to put, reduce their peak size, you know, the size of their fleet, potentially, right? So that's an interesting experiment. But this could be another one where you, uh, for the general, that's, you know, uh, we talked about a private, you know, large private corporation or, or entity like, uh, Infosys or Stanford, we've talked about the public system, public transportation system and their problems. Uh, what about the typical commuter or citizen of a certain place? Well, they could get into a, a commuter program where we will uh, monitor their road use and make recommendations as to when they could travel. This allows us potentially to be able to schedule uh, people by knowing everybody's preferences. And urban commuting or urban congestion is all about the same people making two trips, right, one in the morning from home to work and the other way around, at the same time. So if, all we, you know, if we could stagger this a bit and stick an incentive so that our recommendations are taken, or, you know, then all we're looking for is a 5% to just shift themselves, right? So we'll see how that goes, okay? That's about it. Thank you very much. Right. So the congestors, they, they have a monthly bus pass fee. So the question is, how do the congestors get charged? Okay. The month, there was a monthly bus pass fee. And the seven rupees that I put down uh, per week is the equivalent amount of money you need to charge an extra amount of money to each, for each, to each bus pass. The bus pass fees are around 1,000 rupees a month right now. So that went up to 1,025, 1,030. That's one possible way. But the way the experiment ran was that we had, you know, been uh, given the money from some bus pass surplus or something that's Infosys's uh, money. Uh, but it, looking into the future, because of all the incidental benefits that this scheme has had, uh, the commuters are more happy to come in early. Uh, they had been demanding not just the redeployment of the fleet to later times, but also keeping the cafeterias open for breakfast 
Infosys is not different from Google in the style of campus. Nice, pretty campus, a lot of um, cafeterias, right? But they're closed for breakfast at 9.30, and then so as to be able to open for lunch at 11.30. Now, they were demanding that the cafeterias be kept open longer and various other things like this, right? So looking forwards, it's possible in the Infosys case, the company's going to do it. Whereas at Stanford, for example, you're already paying the parking fees. We're just going to return some portion of that money back to you. And it's possible that a small amount of fee increase takes place. I was having lunch with your, oh, oh there he is, Hal. <laughs> okay. And he just told me this thing where uh, Hal Warren used to be in Berkeley as a professor. Now he's, he's an economist here. And he was saying, hi, Hal. I'm just telling them the story that you told me about how if, uh, if a university professor's salary and parking uh, rates increase at the same rate, then in 10 years, 110% uh, of your salary equals your parking fees, right? <laughs> so, you, right. so this is... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So, so you see that this is, you know, um, there exist methods that are straightforward like this. So you charge a little bit more to everybody and then pay out. Uh, as a lottery, or, or, or even just deterministically. If we return $200 from your parking fees, that will be very valuable. What's the likelihood that this will actually be, uh, I mean, what do you see the, as a barrier to the, something like this in traffic? At the moment, I'm encouraged more than not, right? One year ago, Deepak and I were just having a very precise conversation like this, like, we have no clue, right? So this is the experimental economics sort of world where you have no clue what people are going to do. And just because it worked at Infosys in Bangalore doesn't mean it's going to work at Stanford or somewhere here. But to give you an idea, um, I had a conversation last week in Seattle with the Washington State Department of Transportation people, and there's the same problem, right? There's the Redmond, Redmond in the east and Seattle in the west, and there's 520. There's, there's just two bridges connecting these places, massively congested. And there's a move to having a toll charged, but differential toll. So it's, there's a toll for just collecting money to maintain the bridges, but differential so as to congestion uh, effects are sort of reflected in the tolls. So peak time is higher than off-peak time. But they can't do more than a factor of one and a half or two differential because it's just it's difficult to charge $20 at peak time and then $2 the off-peak time. So it doesn't make much of a sense, right? So it's not clear how much traction they'll get both with the population and with, and with politicians, right? So with an incentive mechanism, something simple like, you know, like 10 coffees in the 11th one is free. So you come 10 times, let's say you cross the bay here, 10 times on Dumbarton or something, and during the uncongested time on the 11th time is free, for example, is going to have a response because you're going to cross the road anyway. All we're saying is do it half an hour earlier, right? Because not like the Seattle people don't have to go to Redmond to work. They have to go. It's the same story in Bangalore. Right. It's a necessary commute. We're just saying stagger it. So what about uh, if you uh, rotate to the bicycle to the park, and are they basically left out from the scheme? Not, no. Uh, the Stanford scheme, the, you get, if you don't get a parking, if you don't get a parking permit, or just purchase a parking permit, then they will give you just what's called clean air cash, and it's equal to something like $300, which is the cost of the lowest parking, lowest you know, parking, grade of parking sticker, right? So it's just because you give up, and, and then they give free, uh, they give bus pass, uh, bus passes for free, and Caltrans uh, tickets as well, or passes, right? So there are, for sure, those kind of things in place. And uh, this is just saying, for sure, people are going to still commute no matter what. People have vehicles, they're going to drive, basically, right? It's a tragedy of commons problem. If you don't address it, it's going to just get worse. So, the 
Right. So uh, why do people need an incentive and what aspect of the incentive is interesting to them, right? That's that's the question. So we, we as you know, uh, at the beginning, at the early part of the talk, I, exp I said that, you know, we did try to explain to people that if you come earlier, it's better for you. Nothing happened. And the I think the typical reason is simply that people are accustomed to a time. There's a rhythm to everybody's lives, right? And, you know, and the bus is like they're not driving themselves, so it feels, it feels okay. Although they do feel like it's, it's taking away time from their lives and so on, right? So nothing happened, in other words, until the incentive mechanism was put in place. And as you saw, after this mechanism was removed, people did, you know, revert. So... And that since that's true around the world, we may assume that there's just a human thing. It's nothing to do with people in a certain place or whatever, right? <laughs> now, in terms of what is it that people liked, we interviewed some of the winners, and we also asked about what their impression was about the sums of money involved in the pyramid. What if the top prize was slightly less, and so on, right? So it, it, how much the money is actually interesting? Many of them said the money is interesting, okay, first of all. But it isn't the case that they were just going to commute early purely for the money. It's actually, they recognize that it's, now that they've, going after the money, they started changing their behavior, that it's actually, they do liberate an hour for themselves every day. And so there's that aspect to it as well. But it is true, I think there's a, the social aspect needs to be better understood, that it seemed like at the end of the third or fourth week, when the third week, the money from the first week's winners the first week's winners decided in the sec early part of the second week, and the money hit the bank accounts in the third week or so, right? Suddenly there's an uptick. You know, no matter how much we advertised earlier and everything, the fact that now money's going out through the scheme, it became like just incredibly well known in the company, okay? And then, you know, one guy who won said that not only did I win, after I won, the guy two cubicles from me started to come early, and he also ended up winning. So it's like, great, okay? so. I think people tend to, you know, uh, overestimate their probability of winning if they know a winner, right? Because suddenly you feel like, well, if he can win. <laughs> it's not like a state lottery where I have no idea who won, right? And, and it's most likely never going to be me, <laughs> right? Here it's like I know who won, right? So, so there's that aspect which we need to understand a little better. Thank you.